framework as the web server. Our API is HTTP. And we use Kafka that uh, was mentioned here earlier um, to, to move messages from the web server to the other side, which is uh, a background process that we have that uh, uses heavily ACA streams. And for each message, for each document or object that, that is being uploaded, um, it does two things. It first uh, persists it in Cassandra, and then it indexes it in Elasticsearch. So Cassandra is a um, wide column-based uh, data warehouse, and, or a key value store, you can, think of, you can think about it. And Elasticsearch is, um, I think uh, you, everyone is familiar, but uh, it's, uh, it's a search engine based on Lucene. And we need them both to allow um, both also um, bulk downloads and streaming, and also full text search. So this is the flow when uh, the user uh, ingest data. Uh, when the user wants to read something, then uh, you don't need Kafka here. The web server just uh, queries Elasticsearch and fetch data from Cassandra and returns to the user. So we're not going to talk about all of these. Uh, our main focus uh, will be a little fact about Kafka and some um, things about Cassandra. Um, let's see a um, few, very few examples of, of how does it work just to feel um, what, what it looks like uh, to work with uh, CMWell. Um, it will be important later for, to, to understand the, the problem the, and the solution. So in this case, we want to, to read something or to query some, some piece of data. And in this case, uh, I was using the uh, Sparkle uh, endpoint, which is a uh, um, standard query language in the linked data world. Uh, it feels a little bit like SQL, but it, uh, it actually um, works on binding um, data to variables. So here I'm looking for the company where Yaakov works at. So I don't know the company, it's a variable, and I want it to be populated for me. And the results will be something like that. Um, so the company we're looking for is this ID, which represents uh, Thomson Waters. Um, so this is basically the input and output, a very simple uh, example. Um, what happens behind the scenes is something like that. An HTTP uh, GET is uh, received in the web server. Um, first, we convert the payload into some sort of case class. In this case, it will be a Sparkle request. Then um, we will query Elasticsearch, fetch data from Cassandra, and eventually we will return to the user human readable response. Another example, this will be the last example, um, what happens when you want to ingest data. So in our example, we were looking for the data um, in, order, in, order for, in order for, uh, for it to be there, we first need to ingest it. So in this case, um, don't worry about the syntax, it's just the standard uh, format in, in the linked data, uh, RDF. But um, this is just the same thing that we saw earlier with the, with the circles and the arrow. So this is the first node and this is the, the predicate or the edge. And this is the, the other node. So when user just uses uh, this kind of request to put data inside, then the response will be something like, yes, we acknowledged it will eventually be there. And let's see how that works behind the scenes. So data is parsed. Um, Kafka messages are being produced by the web server. Um, the moment Kafka uh, said, said to the web server that it got the message, then we can return to, to the user and says, OK, don't worry, it will be there. And later on, on the other side, um, the messages will be consumed, and the data will be persisted in Cassandra and indexed in Elasticsearch. So uh, that's about it. Seems um, very nice. So what was the problem? The problem was like this. Um, normally, in the linked data world, objects are kind of small. Um, it can be a little bit more complex than the uh, example we saw earlier, but it it may be uh, several nodes and edges and not something too, too big. Um, but we do want to support large files. Maybe if someone wants to upload a huge binary file, uh, then it's OK. We support it. Um, but on the other hand, Kafka messages should be small. The default configuration for the maximum payload in Kafka is one megabyte. 
Um, you can configure it to be larger, but it will have uh, memory implications on the consumer side, and it is not considered a good practice. So now we have a problem. We want to, to support large files, but we don't want um, to pass them through Kafka. So as a wise man once said, any problem in computer science can be solved with another layer of indirection. So you can already guess what our solution is going to be. We're just going to pass a pointer in Kafka, which will point to the payload, the big, large payload that is stored somewhere else. So actually what we wanted is a, a key value store. A key value store, um, we wanted it to be distributed because CML is distributed and we wanted the persistence. And we really wanted to keep it inside the process and have it as simple as possible, just put get API and nothing, nothing fancy. Um, and then we thought about it and we tried to look around because every time you want to, to have a solution, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So we, was, we were looking for other options and um, I think there's a, there's a trade-off here that um, it depends on what the task that you want to accomplish is and how much wiring are we going to do. Um, if you are going to have to do a lot of wiring, uh, so maybe it doesn't worth the effort, right? Um, and also, if your task is very straightforward and doesn't have a lot of edge cases, then just write it yourself. So we were looking on, on, on Twitter Util. It seems they have a nice uh, a cache module, which could be a good fit. But first of all, it has no persistence. It's just caching. And we want uh, persistence. And also, I, I'm sure there are good historical reasons for that, but they don't use Scala futures. They use Twitter futures. And we didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, at that point, we decided we're going to, to do something uh, on ourselves. And we called it um, ZStore. Um, this is the, the trait. So as you can see, it's really straightforward. Um, the keys are strings, and the values are just byte arrays. Um, so the put method has two flavors. Um, the first one is just the key value. And the second one, you can see it has a third argument of time to live. So this is the first thing, uh, the first thing I would like to emphasize, that um, it may be surprising that it's not a duration or, or maybe finite duration. Um, it's an int. Um, that is because the underlying implementation is in Cassandra, and we are counting on the time to live feature of Cassandra. Um, which only supports resolution of seconds. So we didn't want to surprise the users of the library and round their finite duration to, to the resolution of seconds, which might be surprising. So we did two things. We used an int. And also, most importantly, we used a meaningful variable name uh, that represents what we want. Um, we have two implementations to the trait. Um, the first one is the main implementation with the underlying uh, Cassandra, which we will get to in a bit. The other, the other one is just in-memory implementation of the trait, just for testing purposes. Um, the usages are, first of all, to address our uh, problem uh, of large files. And we use uh, some hash function on the content of the file to be the key. So. What we, what we are doing is just uh, in case the payload is too large, um, we generate the key and we paste on Kafka just the key and we persist in ZStore the payload. And then on the other side, the BG process that consumes the Kafka messages, it just um, populate the payload from ZStore. And then we, we thought we start using it to other things. And we saw we have this nice API. So why not use it to other things, um, keeping internal state um, and caching? Because you have this uh, uh, nice API. Um, why not use, in, use it for caching? You have this uh, TTL uh, option. And we decided to use memoization. So that will be the next phase. Um, Um, OK, so um, I mean, you, you could have just picked a random um, string for, for the key. 
Um, when you use uh, hash on the content, it makes your content content addressable. So it means that, let's say, um, two users uploaded the same file, but with a different name. So you'll have the benefit that it will only be on the disk once, and they will both be pointing on the same data. This is one benefit uh, I can think of. Isn't it possible that uh, different uh, files with different content will get the same hash so, uh, in some way? Like, it's kind of unlikely, I think. But uh, the possibilities of files are endless, and the uh, hash uh, has boundaries of, uh, of, of uh, range. Yeah, so uh, I don't remember what we use exactly in the, in the implementation. Um, I think you just need to to to, to come up with a with a good um, with a good distribution of of a hash function, and, and you're good to go. I mean, in the big data world, it, it can be because you have a lot a lot of data. Um, but in but in the case of large files, I don't think we have so much large files. So. Um, yes, um, uh, it's kind of out of the scope of this talk, but, but um, the question was if there are metadata on, on the files. So, so basically, um, we, we, coll we store the data in, in, in linked data. So you can just, I mean, the implementation is that also the payload is considered um, a part of linked data. So you can have like a system predicate that says, uh, the file, I the payload is. So you can add to the same subject or to the same node um, other um, um, properties. So it, yes, it can, the answer is yes, you can have metadata on the files. Um, so Redis, first of all, out of the box, it's not distributed, and we want it can be. It can be, I know, but but um, we already have Cassandra, and we wanted something that uh, is in process. We didn't want another another JVM to to run. I mean, the the API is is high level. You can have any underlying implementation. In our case, we have Cassandra, which has um, column columns and tables. So we just uh, we, we will keep you, uh, doing what, we, what works for us. But in terms of API, you can choose any uh, underlying implementation. OK, so moving on, um, we wanted to add another layer on top of that. So right now, we have an API from string to byte array, or more specifically, to future of byte array. And we wanted to generalize it. So users can, can use any type, maybe the uh, the key is not a string, it's a case class. Um, maybe the value is not a byte array, but it's in some sort of object. So well, we wanted to generalize it, and um, we wanted to use memoization. So a few words about memoize, if you're not familiar with. Um, so memoize is just some sort of wrapping function. Um, it gets a function, and it returns a function with the same signature, but it has in an internal cache that if it will be invoked with the same key again, um, you won't do the heavy lifting uh, twice. You will only do it once. So uh, basically, it's kind of a caching, but um, it, it, it has the benefit that you don't have to change anything in your code. Just wrap your existing function with uh, the memoize function. And I will demonstrate it with an example that we saw earlier. So. Do you remember when we talked about the reading data from CMWell? So we have this uh, Sparkle request case class. And we do these two things, which can be um, <laughs> intensive IO tasks. And we want to, to cache them. So if we were going to look at the code, I mean, in practice, it may be a little bit more complex than that. But for the sake of the example, um, let's say that we got an HTTP GET. Um, request and we constructed a case class out of it. Let's assume we, we have this, this request as a case class. And then we have this execute function, which returns the future of the response in a human readable format. And we return it to the user here. Um, and this can be a heavy lifting task, um, which should return the same thing for each, um, for each uh, Sparkle request. Um, assuming the data doesn't change rapidly. So 
it should be very straightforward. Just in the first place, um, you can wrap your execute function with the memoize function. And then you have another version of it that uh, will do the heavy lifting, but only once for each request. And then you're going to use the cached version. So um, before we, we delve into the, the API of the memoize uh, function, let's just understand what it's going to take, what it's going to do. Um, so when the memoize function will be used, so we wanted to first um, try to get the data from ZStore. And uh, we have here some retries. So if the data isn't there for that key, um, we think maybe it will be there in, in a second. So we will try again. And if it exists, great, just return it. And otherwise, do the heavy lifting task. The, in the example before, it was the execute method. And once it returns, <coughs> store the result in ZStore and return the value. Uh, Okay, so the question was if, it, if it's an uh, atomic test um, and what happens if two requests on the same key will be coming uh, concurrently. So um, another, another thing that we do in the implementation is when you have a future that is currently uh, is not completed yet, so it's a future that is um, in air or doing the work and another request is is going uh, is coming in with the same key, so we are going to map them both to the same future. So once it completes, both users will get the responses. So I hope this answers the question. So the, the receiving of the future, getting the future will, will be atomic. So you will get the same future if you request the same key. Yes. Okay. okay. So, but in order to do that. Um, we are not able to do that just yet because we don't know anything about the, the, the types that the user is going to use. So we're going to need some things from the user. We're going to, know, we're going to need to know how to convert from the, the key type to a string. And we're going, to know, we're going to need to know how to map from uh, byte array to the V type and the other way around. Because um, when we want to return value from ZStore, and ZStore only uh, returns byte arrays, so we want to return the value to the user, but map it from byte array to V. And when we store the data in ZStore, um, the task was returning us future of V, and we need future of byte array. So we're going to, to use, we're going to need to know how to do all of these things. Okay, now let's move to how we built the, the um, signature of memoize. It, it, will be, it won't be that short, it will just grow as we think about it. So first of all, um, we have two type parameters. We have the key and the value. And you can see we are, uh, the, f the first argument <coughs> is the heavy lifting task that we want to cache, that we want to memoize. Um, and you can also you can see that the return value is the same as the given function. So that you will be able to use it in your code without too much refactoring. Just wrap it, and that's it. Um, but now we are going to, to need the, all the other things we were talking about. So we have another argument list. We have the digest function that converts from key to string. So I will be able to use that uh, when I want to, uh, to fetch data from ZStore. It should be the key. And then we have these two things that, uh, that uh, I can use to convert from and to a byte array. Another nice uh, feature we added uh, at, th at this point, um, we thought about it that um, when, when you have the uh, task completed, maybe the value that you got back uh, is not something that you want to cache. So, of course, it was a, if it was a failing future, I won't be caching anything because I only have an exception or a throwable. I don't have the value. But even if the future was successful, perhaps the value is not uh, good enough for me. And this is for the user to decide. So 
for the case of, of an uh, HTTP call, maybe the call was just fine. There was not network or I.O. issues. Everything was fine. The feature was successful. But the return status is 500. You don't want to cache that. So we added here to this argument list another argument, which is a predicate on the value. It's a function from V to Boolean um, that uh, means, do I want to keep this value in cache or not? If, if the, if, uh, is this value is meaningful to me or not? And since it's not uh, one, one size fits all, maybe some use cases just, you know, everything is cacheable, then we added a, a default value to this function, which says, I don't care what's the value, just, just put it in cache. Um, but to the other things, I cannot have any default values because I don't know anything about um, key and V. Um, the third argument list <laughs> is some numbers. Um, remember when we said we, we fetch data from ZStore, um, we do some retries to get it. If it's not there in the first place, maybe uh, someone else is going to put there in one second, and this is why the user is asking for that. So um, here, the, uh, the user of the memoirs can define, can fine tune, actually, the, um, these numbers. So we have here the TTL, which is important. We have the, the polling max retries and intervals. So um, in this case, the default values that we were thought about um, was just do five retries in one second delay each, and, and the value will stay in cache for 10 seconds. But anyone can use any values. Um, this is another thing that we thought about when we, when we um, made this library. We thought um, we want to keep it simple. So if the user wants to invoke it without this, the third argument list, go ahead. Everything has default values. You don't have to worry about it. We will do it for you. But if you, do, if, if you are an advanced user, you want to, to fine tune your, your arguments, go ahead. You can do that. Yeah, so the question was, um, why did we choose to have this as, uh, as an argument, uh, as a function that, that goes to, to uh, in an argument list and not have it in, in the implicit scope? So I, I think um, that the question actually is, why didn't we use type classes? <coughs> so um, it's a good question. Um, we didn't thought about it in the, in the first place. Uh, we wanted to keep it simple. And it's actually, it's actually a good question, because we can change it to use type classes. It's, it's, it seems like a good, uh, a good case to use type class. But then again, the user will have to construct his own type classes for that. Might be. OK, um, we do have another argument list here, um, which is the execution context. And this is implicit. And this is something that, um, uh, I mean, sometimes it can be dangerous, or sometimes, I mean, the execution context is always uh, lying there somewhere. and. and I think most of the times, most of us in, in, in POCs, in, we just use global execution context, and that's it. But, but you have to pay attention for that. Because um, so in, in, our, in our case, we're, when we use play framework, so we have this uh, injected um, with the dependency injection when everything starts. But if we go back to this slide, um, so if you think about the execution context, then it is decided here. When we invoke the memoirs function, the execution context that is in this implicit scope is not necessarily the same one in this scope. So it may be surprising. It may be um, a design decision that uh, you want to close on the execution context at the point of creating the memoization. But it's something to think about. Um, and that's about it. Um, this is the 
memoization um, a signature. Um, that's it. Um, before, before you ask uh, questions, uh, I have here one uh, question I, I made uh, earlier. Um, can you use this library? Um, maybe not just like uh, it is, because we are counting on the underlying implementation of Cassandra. If you already use Cassandra, then go ahead. You can use it as is. Um, you're welcome to be inspired. Um, questions? Well, so the question was, what is the role of execution context there? So um, I think everywhere that you are you're mapping features or flat mapping features, it won't compile if it, if it has no execution context um, in, the, in the scope. Um, this, uh, in, in this case, it, I think it, it it, the role of that execution context is to be somewhere for, for uh, the I.O. Because we're going to fetch data from Cassandra or store data in Cassandra, we need something that will, uh, that will manage us in, the, in doing the I.O. So as I said, um, this, um, this particular use case, this particular library doesn't use Elasticsearch. Um, our general use case um, uses Elasticsearch. Uh, we needed to support uh, full text searches. So uh, you cannot search data in Cassandra. So if the user wants to say, I want to know um, which company owns which company, so you, you cannot do this in Cassandra. You can use full text search or other things as so triple stores. Yes, we do save the data twice in Cassandra and in Elastic. How do you handle large files that cannot be hidden securely into one database? Too large to explode? So um, the question was how do we handle large files that cannot fit into memory inside one JVM? So uh, we don't. Um, down the road, uh, it's in our roadmap to have a full streaming API that will just stream the data from the HTTP until uh, the end, until Cassandra. Um, I think uh, we have, uh, I think there is some rubber in, uh, in Akka streams that uh, you, can you, you can use a sync to Cassandra or something like that. Um, currently, we are using byte arrays. So byte arrays fit in memory. Uh, there is no other, other choice. So I think our limitations can be like, I don't know, a couple of gigs. But if you have like a load on the server, a lot of uh, files are uploaded. So, uh, OK, the question was, what if there are a um, load on, on the cluster and we have many uh, large file requests at the same time? So, um, so to be honest, it never happened. Our use case is, is for linked data, and most of the data is, <coughs> is small. Um, there are some, some use cases, uh, also in production, I think we have like five megabytes zip files or, or something like that. It's not something that should, should stress us. Um, the cluster can be stressed in case of uh, massive ingests of data, because um, big data can, can be intense. Um, but in terms of large files, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, saw any uh, uh, problems with that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>